welcome to the fight for the future live stream this is episode five um we uh, just before we get started i want to remind folks to subscribe uh, click the bell if you want notifications uh that the episode has gone live and also um we are now on apple podcasts and spotify so if you want to subscribe there um you can check it out that way um and that's the audio only version um, today we are joined by uh, Caitlin Seely George, who is the director of campaigns and operations here at Fight for the Future, um, and we will be discussing with her the relaunch of our site, uh, Battle for the Net. Um, and we're also joined by uh, Dayton Young, who is our director of product um, here at Fight for the Future, who we will be talking about um, uh, about the death of the Patriot Act a year ago. Um, and we'll be going over that a little bit. And we have a, as you can see, a mystery guest here who will be going over some interesting stuff a little bit later, but we will, we will leave that for the end. It's actually pretty cool. Um, but let's get started uh, with the uh, discussion around Battle for the Net. So Caitlin, I guess we are launching our new uh, version of the Battle for the Net website. Um, and I just wanted to chat with you a little bit about that today. Could you maybe go over the, like what's going on with that? Yeah, for sure. So battleforthenet.com has been kind of a, a long-term hub for grassroots action on net neutrality and ensuring people have um, access to reliable, affordable internet access. Um, I actually don't know, and maybe Dayton and Joe know when we first launched this site. Um, but it's gone through many iterations, pushing for um, the Obama FCC to adopt net neutrality and title to um, authority over ISPs. Um, it was a, a important place for actions um, during Trump's administration as the FCC chair Ajit Pai um, got rid of those uh, protections and policy and um, dumped dumped net neutrality. Um, and over, you know, the past handful of years as we've kind of continued to push um, the, the value of, of net neutrality in order to make sure people can get online, obviously, especially in the last year, this has been really critical under the pandemic when we've all been um, online for, for work, for school, to figure out or try to figure out how and where to get a vaccine when vaccine rollout was happening. Um, you know, telehealth conversations, all that sort of stuff. So um, obviously the importance of, of having, you know, access to open internet has been really critical over the past year. Um, it's also really highlighted the digital divide and the fact that millions of people are without access to um, reliable internet, um, which, you know, just becomes a serious safety uh, issue right now. So so that's been kind of like the, the background. Um, but with the Biden administration, um, we have kind of a new path forward to winning back net neutrality and um, ensuring folks have access to internet. And so as a part of that, we have relaunched Battle for the Net, um, still as the hub for grassroots action on this issue, but with a new look and some new calls to action. Um, and, and kind of laying out the, the path forward. And yeah, it's kind of, you know, I think, I think the website has gone through many iterations, but where we're at now, when you see the design, we think that there's um, kind of a lot of positive energy moving forward. Um, we kind of see, see victory is within reach. Um, and so there's kind of a new, a new vibe, a new energy on the, um, on the site overall that, um, we'll hopefully kind of harness the same, um, some of the same folks and also new folks who have historically engaged on this issue. Um, and we can kind of continue to, to focus that energy around, um, around pushing forward for change. So um, can you tell us a little bit about like the phase in this fight that we're reaching where um, it, it seems like with the new administration, we might actually be able to um, get net neutrality back and, Battle for the Net has been a huge component in that fight in the past, um, and hopefully it will be a really important force going forward. Can you tell us a little bit, bit about like the way that Fight for the Future is going to be like participating in this like third phase of the fight for net neutrality? Yeah, for sure. So I, you know, I think like you said, we do kind of see a path forward to winning back net neutrality, and there are kind of 
two pieces of it. Um, the first one is getting the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, to reinstate net neutrality and, and Title II um, uh, protections. And, and that's kind of our first step in the process that we're launching right now. Um, the first piece of that is that Biden needs to um, appoint a fifth FCC commissioner. Um, after Ajit Pai stepped down, the commission was, is, is currently deadlocked um, two to two with four commissioners. And um, we need to appoint a real champion as the fifth commissioner in order to, to kind of move this forward as a priority. Um, we need someone who does not have ties to industry, to telecom. Um, we need someone who's actually going to stand up to the ISPs and champion people's needs. Um, so that's what we're calling for right now at battleforthenet.com. And people can go there, um, take action, um, and send a message to the Biden administration and kind of key um, people within the administration to, to both demand that they prioritize this appointment, because at this point they still haven't actually um, nominated someone. Um, they can... And then, and and specifically, demand that it's someone without ties to to big cable and the telecom industry. So that's the first piece of the process, um, and and what we're asking folks to take action on <coughs> right now. Um, and then moving from there, once we get a champion at the FCC, there will be um, a set of actions that we need people to take in order to you know get the FCC to reinstate net neutrality. There will be um, some rounds of comment periods and things like that. So that's kind of one piece of the puzzle. And then the other piece that we're going to be pushing forward is um, getting Congress to pass legislation that enshrines net neutrality into law so that every time there's a, a change in the who's in the White House, this isn't an issue that comes up with FCC commissioners, you know, reinstating and then getting rid of and reinstating and getting rid of these protections. So um, that's another piece of the puzzle where we will need to be calling on Congress to pass this legislation. And I believe it was last week, Senator Markey announced um, on, a, on a, um, a congressional briefing that we ha helped to host that he intends to reintroduce the Save the Internet Act, which is legislation that would um, put, put net neutrality protections into law. Um, and so, that will be a kind of another piece of the puzzle that we'll need to be pushing forward, asking folks to email, call their legislators. Um, you know, in the past we've hosted major days of actions and live streams um, when votes were happening and, and when some uh, key conversations were happening around this legislation. So I think we'll continue to do that so that folks can stay just fully, you know, up to date, have the information they need and have kind of access to the the most important action that they can be taking um, to push forward net neutrality, both at the FCC and in Congress. So without being able to show the site, because of, for some reason, Zoom isn't okay. letting us do that right now. It's actually really yeah. funny. Like it, I can't even change it. Um, without being able to show that uh, visually illustrate, can you like explain a little bit about the changes that have been made to Battle for the Net and what people can expect um, in, in terms of the way that it functions in the future? Yeah, totally. And you can actually see our, our mystery guest is um, showing uh, the image that's that's um, on battleforthenet.com. Um, obviously, folks listening can go to battleforthenet.com um, to, to take a look at it yourselves. Um, but yeah, we're so the way the site has kind of always worked and will continue to work is the the top line action, the most urgent thing will be at the top of the page. So it's pretty easy for folks to um, take action. Right now, after you sign um, sign the message and send it to the White House and to your senators um, to ask them to prioritize putting a champ in at the FCC, there's a after action where you can send a tweet to um, some of the key decision makers in the administration as well. So there are kind of a couple key things you can do right at the top. Um, in the future, you know, it might be that we ask you to also call your legislators or something like that. So there, that will, that will always be updated with the most urgent action for folks to take. Um, and then if you scroll down the page, you'll also see we're partnering with 20 plus organizations on this effort um, to make sure that we're, you know, getting 
hundreds of thousands of, of messages into our decision makers on this to really show how much of a priority this is. So um, yeah, it's just really awesome that we're partnering with a ton of other groups uh, on this issue. It's definitely something that, you know, widely across the board is being supported. Um, and then, yeah, when you scroll down, there's a lot more information, especially I know we have some folks who have been with Fight for the Future for a really long time who are well versed in net neutrality and have been a part of this fight for a long time, which is awesome. But then we've also got some newer folks who have joined us um, more recently and, you know, possibly have been engaging in other issues like um, surveillance or copyright issues and so um, might need to get up to speed on what net neutrality is all about and so there's more information below um, kind of walking through the history of the fight you know what what does net neutrality mean what does it include um, and yeah going through the history of our work there are some awesome videos as well um, net neutrality was the topic for a John Oliver oh yeah cool so this is actually being shared now so yeah it was a um, a topic for last week tonight a few years ago which um did a really good job of just kind of talking about this issue and um it's you know it's an older episode but it still um kind of covers the topic pretty well and there are a few other videos that kind of um that are useful in, in getting up to speed on the issue um so that's one of the sections and then we also have just kind of a general campaign plan for what's the what's the um process from here how are we going to get to victory and our plan is to update that with kind of more more specific information as um as the fight continues and so people can have a clear sense of what are what is it going to take to to win on this fight and what are the next steps so yeah that's the fight the the site kind of overall um and yeah our designer Bastian, who i know has been on um, a handful of these live streams before i think did a really nice job um, yeah, just kind of creating a good look and feel for the site. It definitely to me feels really energetic and like there's a lot of opportunity um, and and also, you know, presenting a ton of information and, and hopefully what folks see is a really kind of clear, easy to, easy to maneuver um, layout. So if people wanted to do something today, take action today to impact this fight, what's something that they could do like right now? I mean, the best thing to do is go to battleforthenet.com, um, send a message to the White House, and it'll also go to your senators calling on them to nominate and uh, confirm a fifth commissioner to the FCC who does not have ties to the telecom industry. Um, so you can do that right at the top of battleforthenet.com. And then after that, there'll be an option, like I said, to if you're on Twitter, um, send some tweets to um, some top top folks within the administration to make sure that they see this and can see that there is really a broad groundswell of support for action on this issue. So those are kind of the top things to do. And then after you do that, you know, sharing battleforthenet.com with friends, family, and encouraging them to take action um, is always super, super helpful as well in, in terms of growing the movement and growing the number of people who are engaging in this fight. Cool. I'm going to uh, switch gears a little bit to Patriot Act. Dayton, that's something that you've been working on. I know that we have um, a live stream coming up on Monday for that. So just want to remind folks about that. But could you please uh, give us just a little bit more information about what's going on um, on the topic of the Patriot Act? Yeah, of course. Um, for those who don't know, and there might be some people who don't know, the Patriot Act was a, uh, a law or a series of regulations that were passed uh, in the wake of um, September 11th, 2001 terrorist attacks that uh, gave the government kind of secret permissions to uh, spy on Americans. Uh, and uh, this was kept secret from the public. This was kept secret from uh, the United States Congress for many, many years. Uh, and uh, it really only came to light because of Edward Snowden, what pe most people have heard about, um, who was, uh, I believe, a contractor uh, working for uh, the government. And uh, he collected a bunch of files, uh, proving all the different ways in which the government's uh, you know, secret surveillance program worked, uh, collecting internet traffic, internet history, phone records, call details, all of these sorts of things, uh, just indiscriminately collecting every piece of data that uh, the government could find on pretty much everybody and then sorting through it after that, no warrant necessary. 
And uh, he revealed this to um, a journalist named Glenn Greenwald, who published these accounts and uh, made international news everywhere. Edward Snowden uh, was, uh, you know, forced to flee America. He's currently living in exile in Russia. Uh, and uh, he continues to speak about, uh, you know, government surveillance uh, all over the world whenever he can. So we learned about these revelations uh, and a lot of politicians, a lot of grassroots activists, a lot of ordinary people have been trying to fight against it, getting uh, the government to stop doing this abusive uh, surveillance behavior. And uh, finally, about a year ago, um, political pressure was great enough uh, that Congress uh, failed to reauthorize the Patriot Act. So uh, a year ago, uh, on March 15th, so the one year anniversary is coming up, is, is when the Patriot Act officially expired. And we've gone one year without having the Patriot Act uh, in place. So um, on this coming Monday, we are celebrating the uh, death of the Patriot Act. Uh, and we're going to try to, you know, contact our uh, representatives in Congress and let them know that we don't like this uh, Patriot Act, that we don't like the government spying and, uh, you know, performing surveillance on us. And uh, we want it to stay dead. Uh, unfortunately, there's been some political momentum in the past few months to bring back the Patriot Act. Um, the uh, uh, politicians on both sides of the aisle have started talking about the importance of, uh, you know, uh, performing surveillance to um, to prevent domestic terrorism is the new, you know, uh, threat and the justification for spying on everybody. Uh, FBI Director Christopher Wray recently testified in Congress in regards to the uh, um, January 6th attack on Capitol Hill that, uh, you know, he thought that uh, encrypted messaging apps like Apple's iMessage and Signal are a threat to America and they're a threat to law enforcement because they prevent the government from spying on our communications. And uh, so he is kind of attacking encryption again and setting the stage for politicians to um, make arguments about how important it is to you know read our text messages and listen to our phone calls and collect our internet data and uh, it's just it's all bogus arguments built on you know faulty logic and uh, it's, it's people wanting to invade our privacy so it's really important that even though the Patriot Act has been dead for a year it was abused for nearly two decades to commit all sorts of unconstitutional um, activities against the American public you know I've been surveilled, you've been surveilled, nearly everybody in America has been surveilled by the government and we just don't even know the, the extent to which, um, you know, our activities have been, have been spied on and collected. So we just really wanna do a great job of uh, reaching out to Congress and letting everybody know, hey, this is our privacy, we really care about this and uh, it's, it's very important for you to take this seriously. That's really interesting. So if people want to take action right now, um, and in regards to trying to stop the Patriot Act from being revived, what can they do? Yeah, the most important thing you can do is uh, go to stopthepatriotact.org. We have a form there. Um, you can see that on the screen right here. It's a really cool looking uh, site, also designed by uh, the great Bossian Catro, who's our designer. Um, and, uh, you know, read up on what's going on if you don't know. There's a lot of information down the page, but that first paragraph kind of lets you know a little bit about what's going on. You can enter your name, your address, and uh, and send a, um, an email to your representatives in Congress. You can also make phone calls and let them know how you feel about this. And check out all the information on the page. Understand the history of what's going on. Uh, you can watch videos about, uh, I think there's a video of Edward Snowden speaking about, uh, you know, what he's experienced and what he's seen and, and how this impacts the world on the page. Uh, there's information about the history of the Patriot Act and how it's been abused to, uh, you know, perform surveillance on journalists, on Black Lives Matter activists, uh, on ordinary people like you and me. And so, you know, you don't have to take my word for it. You can click the links. You can read from these, you know, uh, journalistic outlets with a lot of integrity uh, that have reported on these and published their findings and published, uh, you know, uh, proof of what they're reporting on. And it's just very important to understand how this is, uh, you know, how this is going on and how uh, politicians and, uh, and uh, law enforcement and intelligence and officials are abusing these laws to, uh, you know, cross boundaries, invade our privacy and spy on us. Just so that people understand what's at stake here, um, can you speak a little bit about the history of the Patriot Act? What kind of capabilities it granted the government? Um, you know, what 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 the, what they're able to do 
uh, if they have sign off from Congress um, by, by a real authorization of the Patriot Act? Sure. Um, it appears that they have been using the Patriot Act as justification to uh, just collect internet history in mass. So uh, tapping into uh, Google, Yahoo, uh, uh, backend infrastructure to collect information on the websites we are all visiting. You know, what, what your IP address is, what uh, websites your IP address is, is visiting during the day. They have lists and lists and lists of all of the, the internet activity you've been, uh, you know, you've been doing. So if uh, they, if, if members of the government, whether it's the FBA or the NSA, you know, feel like they want to look into you or me or, or understand what's going on, they have reams of data to look into and say, well, what's, let's go fishing. Let's see if this person has done, done anything bad. Of course, that's not the way our system is supposed to work. It's supposed to, you know, uh, law enforcement officials are supposed to have, um, you know, probable cause, go to a judge and get a warrant to, uh, you know, root through my personal effects to come into my home and, and look in my cupboard and see if I'm doing anything bad. And our digital data should be protected by those same laws. But unfortunately, many people in our government are treating it uh, as a separate thing. So they can look at our internet history and understand all the things we've been, you know, um, browsing, all the things we've been looking up, sites we've been visiting, um, you know, and that reveals a lot of very personal information about us, our health, uh, our finances, our interests, things that just aren't the government's business, things that aren't public and shouldn't be. So I think that's a pretty huge privacy violation right there that we should all be concerned about. Uh, I believe they can also access and collect emails uh, through, you know, uh, backend access to uh, internet providers. Um, they, they've been shown repeatedly to be collecting our call data information. So our phone numbers and what phone uh, numbers we are contacting, you know, the times, dates, the length of the conversations we're having with others. And they're just collecting that in, you know, in mass, in bulk. Again, they're not saying we're concerned about Dayton Young. Uh, we want a warrant to check out who Dayton Young's been calling. They're just collecting all of the phone information that's out there and they're rooting through it when and how they want to. Uh, that's really, really, really disturbing. And courts have declared that to be illegal, that sort of data, uh, bulk data collection to be illegal. And uh, it came out after they were ordered to stop by the courts, they continued to collect this information in violation of court orders. Uh, they said it was an accident, but I don't really know how you accidentally collect, you know, mm -hmm. millions and tens of millions of, of call records. Um, I don't have accidents like that. Uh, I don't have accidents where I accidentally, uh, you know, ignore uh, federal judges. Uh, those seem like pretty big oopsies to me. So it's very, un, uh, you know, not compelling when I hear uh, those sorts of excuses for how they're abusing our privacy. They continue to do it. Uh, and uh, I think, again, that's something that should disturb all of us. Beyond the obvious unconstitutionality of of the of the Patriot Act in the first place, is there a, like a like a history of abuse of the Patriot Act, or um, on on the other on the other side, is there any evidence that the Patriot Act has done anything to stop terrorist attacks or harm to the United States? You know, that's a really great question, and uh, the government's own files show us that uh, you know, all of the spying they did collecting our phone records, this phone call records program of, of collecting uh, data on who we're calling, um, it failed to identify or prevent a single unique terrorist uh, you know, threat or attack. It didn't do any good. That's the government's own uh, you know, uh, review of their program and how they're spending you know, $100 million to collect hundreds of millions of phone records and their own internal audit said this actually didn't do any good. So uh, why do they keep you know, wanting to promote this? Why do they keep wanting to collect information on us if it's proven that they can't even you know, use this information to stop a single terrorist attack or identify a single unique terrorist threat? Um, the answer has to be that they wanna continue spying on us because collecting information on us just uh, helps them in, in some way. They, they like having that power over us. They like having that authority over us. And we've seen, uh, especially over the past year, documents come out that show that the FBI was labeling Black Lives Matter uh, activists as uh, 
what did they say, black identity extremists mm -hmm. and using that completely made up, uh, you know, moniker to perform surveillance and spy on these people and track them and, and, and uh, you know, listen to their phone calls and, and gather their emails. And again, they didn't find that any of these Black Lives Matter activists were doing anything wrong, but they just, you know, painted them as a danger or a threat uh, somehow and use those lies to continue spying on them. Uh, and it's just very, very disgusting because that chills our free speech, that threatens our, our, you know, freedom when we have the government, you know, spying on us because the government simply doesn't agree with our politics. Well, the government doesn't have to agree with our politics. Um, we as individuals have a right to have a say in how the government is run mm -hmm. and to vote for elected officials who represent our ideas and our politics. So when you when you see the FBI and the the NSA using these broad surveillance powers to, um, you know, squash political opposition uh, that would you know potentially threaten their ability to abuse uh, their um, surveillance tools and spy on us. I mean, you, you see how the power structures just uh, reinforce each other and uh, create a very very uh, dangerous and abusive uh, system for all of us. Given that it's clearly unconstitutional. Is there, if, if, if in the event that the Patriot, Patriot Act was reauthorized, what is the chance that we could, um, you know, mount some sort of a Supreme Court challenge to the Patriot Act? I mean, I don't even want to get into the, the what if, because I, I think the, the safest thing we can do to prevent abuse is just to, uh, you know, make sure that the Patriot Act doesn't get reauthorized to, um, you know, let's, let's not put it in the hands of, uh, of unelected judges. Let's not put it in the hands of, of a Supreme Court or, you know, district judges who were appointed by, uh, you know, whichever president. Uh, let's, let's keep it in our hands. And the way we can do that is by contacting our representatives, contacting, you know, our Congress people and letting them know, hey, this is awful. Uh, the FBI has been spying on Black Lives Matter activists. You know, I went out to Black Lives Matter um, protests over the summer. I know a lot of people did. Uh, that, you know, the FBI and NSA kind of feel like that gives them the right to spy on us. And that's not right. So this is affecting us. This is affecting, you know, us directly. It's affecting the people in our communities. And uh, let's not put it in the hands of judges to decide. Let's let our lawmakers know, hey, this was awful. This went on for nearly 20 years. Uh, I believe uh, previous FBI director, I could be wrong, uh, Clapper, uh, went in front of Congress and said uh, there was there's no such program where we were, uh, you know, performing surveillance on the American public. And when it came out that uh, we were, he said, oh, I wasn't lying. I, I was just referring to the programs that we weren't using to spy on the American public. Uh, not the one that we were, because I thought when I was asked if we were spying on the American public, they were asking about the programs that we weren't using to spy on the American public, not the ones we were. And it's just like the most insane lie that you could possibly tell to the public. Uh, and, you know, this guy stood up in front of Congress and lied under oath to them and said, well, it wasn't actually a lie, so you don't need to hold me accountable. And, and Congress let him get away with it. So, you know, um, we need to we need to not allow these people to have these uh, justifications, these excuses, um, because they're going to lie to us. They're going to hide things from us. They're going to abuse these powers that they have. And so let's just make sure that they don't have any possible you know, weapons that they can use against us. So we've got a big live stream coming up on Monday about this. Um, could you tell folks a little information, maybe where they can see it, when it's going to happen, and just a brief overview of what's going to be going down on Monday? Yeah, uh, like I said, Monday is the one year anniversary of the end of the Patriot Act when it expired. Uh, lawmakers let it expire, kind of probably on accident, uh, but we're very glad that it happened no matter how it happened. So we're going to celebrate that and we're going to create a day of action, uh, getting people to contact their lawmakers and say, hey, this is a good thing. We don't need to bring it back. Let it stay dead. Uh, so you can go to stopthepatriotact.org. We have a section up there right now that is actually counting down the days, hours, minutes, and seconds until the live stream starts. The live stream goes uh, live at noon. We're going to have uh, folks from a few different, uh, um, you know, human rights and digital rights organizations, such as Fight for the Future, uh, Free Press, and Demand Progress. We're going to be talking about, uh, you know, these same issues in depth. Uh, we're going to be talking about the history of the Patriot Act, how it's been abused. Um, why it's so important for us to fight it. And, uh, and then we're gonna ask everybody to, to contact Congress. 
It's going to be a very cool thing uh, to be a part of, and I suggest that everybody who's interested stop by stopthepatriotact.org uh, on Monday, March 15th at 12 p.m. Eastern time and, uh, and check out the live stream. Cool. Well, thank you very much for uh, going over all of that with me, Dayton. That was really interesting. And I really hope that people uh, check it out. It's stopthepatriotact.org. And that's going to be uh, on Monday at noon Eastern. Um, I'm going to change gears a little bit and switch to our uh, mystery guest here. So uh, in, the, uh, in the corner where we've been seeing the screen capture, which by the way, Thank you so much, Ken. Um, we, uh, we've got uh, Ken Mickles here, who is our uh, who is a developer here at uh, Fight for the Future. And we've also got Vasian Catro, who is our lead designer. Um, and Ken wanted to share some information with uh, with our audience and, and just go over some some cool stuff. So Ken, take it away. Yeah, so uh, Vasian in particular has been like messing around with uh, Clubhouse, which is like this uh, this new social network that's out, right? Like totally audio only. And um, at the moment, like exclusively available for iPhone. Um, and yeah, like we wanted to give that a try for Fight for the Future. Cause like we've been feeling like Clubhouse like has like um, just sort of this like early Twitter vibe at the moment where like we think it can kind of work as like a social media thing for Fight for the Future. Cause it's like, um, I don't know. It's like this intersection right now. Like it's mostly like just people uh, talking about tech stuff. Uh, and like, uh, we kind of feel like if we get in there and we hit them with the digital rights, like it's like a good time to do that. Um, so yeah, so we wanted to uh, have a conversation on there with everybody, but the app only works for iPhone, right? Which is like, like a bummer. Um, but what's cool is somebody made an unofficial version for Android so we can bring along the masses. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I installed it on my, uh, my test device here and it seems to work. So I was hoping we could uh, get it set up for, uh, for Dayton, uh, Joe, and I don't know, Caitlin, I don't know if you're still on Android or if you have interest in joining this, but you're welcome to if both of those things apply. Well, I will get the <laughs> link ready, yeah. go, go for it. Okay, cool, cool, I am, cool. I am so still on it, Okay, cool. Well, all right. So yeah, so I got I got five invites here, like burning a hole in my pocket. So uh, there's three three of you. So you can all get on Clubhouse with us in this uh, this sort of roundabout way. Um, so here is the link, right? It's uh, this GitHub thing by somebody named Grishka, and the app is called House Club that they've created. Um, this is not distributed on Google Play, right? Because they're not allowed to uh, put it on Google Play uh, because, you know, it wouldn't get approved, right? With that app store. Uh, so the way that they're distributing it is uh, just on GitHub, right? You can go into the releases and click that little assets link and you get an APK, which is like a package for Android um, that if you just kind of click that link in your Android browser, in, the, in Chrome or whatever web browser you happen to have on your Android device. And I'll paste this into our, uh, our group chat so you all have easy access to it. If you click that one there, uh, you should be able to, you should like kind of get a pop-up. Well, it'll download it, I think. And then you'll be prompted to ask if, uh, they, if you want to accept the installation. And for folks who want to follow along, I have provided a link to the GitHub page uh, in the description of this live stream. So if you want to, if you also have Android um, and are able to sideload it, um, you can follow along here. Yeah, I mean, I think like this whole section is like not going to work in an audio format, but like, I think it's probably fine for us to do now. Um, we need I to do it anyway, so might as well do it live, right? So you can, you can describe the step-by-steps and yeah. <laughs> thorough visual audio format. I think this is actually a really good opportunity, Ken, to sort of highlight the problem that is being solved here, which is it's a major problem on iOS. This is something that I know is very personally important to you. It's a major problem on iOS, which is that you cannot sideload applications. Um, at least on Android, you can, but there is still the problem of this gatekeeping aspect of the app store. Can you maybe discuss, you know, the, the, the politics? Um, sure. And, right. Like so, around like side loading and why it's important and why this is why, why we shouldn't even have to uh, 
be be locked out of of clubhouse on android <laughs> right and, and yeah like there's a couple things there right because there's one it's like why so like clubhouse has like a ton of hype right now right and like why is it only available on the iphone in that case and like the reason for that i would say is because like the iphone is like the like the more profitable market right so it's like that's the one you go to first mm-hmm. but um you know like uh you so so like more or less what that's showing, right, is that like iPhone like kind of has a monopoly on like the, the business models available to you. Uh, because like you could, you know, like say you had an app that like uh, I like the Apple App Store was not going to approve. Um, you could be like, oh, I'm just going to go over to Android. But like no, nobody does that. You know what I mean? Like there mm-hmm. is like there's not a way for you to have a software business like unless you can get iPhone as part of it, like a mobile software business anyway. So yeah, I don't know. This just feels like very telling to me. Like it's like sort of like revealing like how much control over Apple has over like, I don't know, I guess like the mind share of, of uh, at least the people like funding the apps, right? That they're like, you know, it's like you can be like super duper funded and like not even have an Android app yet. Mm-hmm. So there's like, there's that step, right? And then there's like, uh, all right, so like th- this is like a very, like a fairly non-controversial app, you know, it's like people can talk to each other and whatever, right? So this will get approved for Android eventually, but it's not there yet. So it's like, it's cool that somebody has figured out this way to sort of like backfill and create their own um, and distribute that. And like, had that happened the reverse way, right? Like, so if there was like an Android one and everybody was on that, and then like me and Vastian have iPhones and we wanted to join you, like there really wouldn't be like an easy way for us to just like hop in and install this like a- as easily as I'm presenting to you anyway. Cause it's like, I can just give you this link and you can like click an approve thing on your Android device and install it. Like on, on iOS, like we would end up needing to, like I would either need, like I would need to be part of the developer program and do like a custom build into my phone. Mm-hmm. Or we would need to install like some certificates and like get a thing through like a test flight build, which would also have to go through the app store. And it would be like, this whole process that like I just feel like nobody would actually do to get like a like a like a hacked version of something like onto the the iPhone platform. So it's like I don't know. Like in a reverse situation, we basically wouldn't be able to do this. I guess is what I'm getting at. Cool. So let's get a link in the chat for the clubhouse room because I think the idea is that you you and Vasian want to uh, have a clubhouse room after yes. this live stream, right? Yeah. Okay. So if, if you're not in the video, send it to me. If you are in the video, please, uh, Bastian or Ken, um, post some information. And, and let's let's talk a little bit about about Clubhouse and what you get, what you guys would like to do today. Um, so um, oh, okay, uh, oh, and there's yeah, there is the second step here to like get through with actually setting this up where I need to invite you guys and then like do a hack play to sure. uh, approve it. But I can do that without talking about it. So I just want to yeah, say let's that let's do the troubleshooting time. after. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> Go for it, Vasim. What were you saying? No, I was just saying uh, that that's that's awesome that can figure that out because I was uh, I had people considering actually getting an iPhone just because of Clubhouse because a lot of hype is going on there. Mm-hmm. Because this is cool. Like, so, so yeah, I- what like what is the hype, or Vasim? Have you been doing like joining? Well, I mean, like, uh, I mean, I wouldn't buy a, uh, I wouldn't go and buy a phone just because uh, of Clubhouse, but like, it depends on what your interest is, is on. But I feel like um, it's like, a, it, to me, the, the, the cool thing that I find in it is like, especially with COVID and everything, like people feel less social at the moment and like, it's the right time for the app to sort of uh, work well. Cause it's like, uh, you hang out on a room with, um, with, a lot of people on different interests. Uh, so uh, lately has been exploding because of NFT space, uh, uh, like, you know, the NFT um, that is going on, like all the discussions that are happening around NFTs are happening on Twitter and also on Clubhouse. So like Clubhouse is a version of Twitter, I would say, where conversation happens, but it's more audio oriented. And like, um, it, it, it is it is a, a crazy, uh, um, way of, of contacting people. I was just um, sharing this with, with Ken today. It was like like a couple of days ago, I was like on a room just listening. I was also as a speaker because you are divided as a speaker or as a listener. And I was listening to this conversation about NFTs. And then 
I listened for like an hour as a, as a way I would listen a podcast and then I just put my phone away and I was like just lying down watching something uh, a movie and just get a notification I opened that I'm like MC Hammer followed you and I'm like wait how because I was on the same room with MC, MC Hammer, Hammer is following you that's yeah, awesome. I was like, yeah. yeah that's yeah that was I mean probably there uh, but the, the cool thing about the whole clubhouse thing is like you can be on the room with uh, and ask questions directly to uh, people who you always uh, love their work or like you know uh, looked up to and like it makes the world uh, a smaller place and also like you hear different background of stories and and conversation happening like it's more natural and human to human in a way of like that uh, other apps like twitter or instagram or facebook would not sort of allow because with messages is a way of there is a lot of room for interpretation on what what the intention of of a of, of a word or even just a sentence or like a conversation is so I feel like with clubhouse it's like a little bit more direct and it's like more open and uh, especially with the NFT scene is like that kind of boosted the whole, it, it became like the, the, the club uh, for talking about NFTs. It's like Twitter and, and um, Clubhouse. So let's, but, yeah, I mean, like oh, there sorry, is a lot ahead. of things. No, no, I'll just, yeah. I mean, like if you have any specific questions uh, because I don't know how many of us here are, uh, have been using it uh, clearly, Caitlin and Dayton, you haven't because you are on Android. Uh, I don't know about you, Joe, but uh, no. uh, so yeah, it's, I mean, it's, I'm still getting used to it. So there are a lot of things and I think the app, it's also going to need some updates and so on because it has issues. I was just showing, sharing with uh, Ken today that a way, like when someone is talking on Clubhouse and if you want to, everybody agrees or like wants to applaud something there is not such an option like you applaud someone when it's talking or like saying something that you all agree into saying like you know and like ju just doing this like yes i agree with that what you're saying so the way is like you mute and unmute like all the time and it's like the mic showing there so if you see that on clubhouse knows that somebody is like clapping or like uh, applauding <laughs> that was a funny thing that just, I learned. yeah it's a fun way to like take over the user interface yeah well, I just wanted to thank everybody for joining. It was a very interesting episode. I, I really appreciate you all being here. Um, and yeah, um, if you like this uh, live stream, make sure that you subscribe to the channel um, and that you click the bell so that you can get notifications in the future. Um, we do this every week um, at one o'clock on Fridays. Um, so you can always catch us here at that time. That's uh, one o'clock Eastern time. Um, and we're now on Apple podcasts and Spotify as well. Um, so if you want to listen to the audio only version, or if you aren't able to make, uh, one of the live streams, you can always catch it there. And we also have a playlist, uh, on the account here of the actual video versions of the live streams as well. Um, thanks again to everyone who is able to join. Um, thanks to, you know, all the people that were able to watch today and we will see you, uh, next week. So bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye.